Hi, I'm Dao Vu, host of our new weekend morning show, Weekend View. We're taking weather to a whole new place. Right now, fun, learn how to relax and play. Just lounge and let my hair down and enjoy the day. The weather will clear and bring sunny rays. Birds and bees and turning leaves and things that make you say, Oh, just down to let your hair down and enjoy the day. Come on, it won't be too long to see things go away. Cause you just might end up seeing something new inside my. Join us for Weekend View on the Weather Channel. The weekend is finally here. Blizzards. Ice. Falling from the sky and breaking beneath our feet. Storms at sea. Floods. and bitter cold that cuts to the bone. These are the extremes of winter weather, often striking with fury. We've made great headway in our ability to forecast weather, but snowstorms and extreme winter weather is still one of those areas that is one of our greatest challenges. And it varies so much from year to year, it just really makes things fun or terrible, depending on your point of view. Every year, dozens of winter storms tear across the country, but only a few push the limits. What set the extremes? from the regular storms are strong winds or extreme cold temperatures or layers of ice that somehow take a regular storm and make it into something much worse. And wind is probably the biggest factor. Three, four, five inch snow without wind is just something pretty to enjoy. With wind, that's when the nightmares start appearing. Blizzards occur when snow is combined with wind speeds that frequently gust to at least 35 miles per hour. Visibility drops to less than a quarter mile. Traveling on highways during these conditions is treacherous and often impossible. Air travel can be just as risky. On January 13, 1982, Air Florida Flight 90 took off during a snowstorm from National Airport in Washington, D.C. The temperature was in the low 20s, and up to six inches of snow had fallen. Ice had built up on the 737's wings. That was a old-fashioned nor'easter. The temperatures weren't real cold, it was a little below freezing, but you know, strong winds, heavy snow. Many people would have just called it a typical storm had it not been for the crash. The flight lasted about 30 seconds. The plane only made it to the 14th Street Bridge before diving into the icy waters of the Potomac River. Most of the 79 passengers on board were killed instantly, but a few survived. 
after I got outside of the aircraft, I was totally confused, where did all this water come from? Initially, I couldn't associate taking off from National Airport with water. As I made my way outside of the aircraft, the only place that wasn't solid ice was what we had broken up. Rescue crews did not have boats or the equipment to save the passengers from the 34-degree waters. A U.S. Park Police helicopter was called in to help. It was not flying weather at all. We were looking slant visibility through the chin bubble to try and see where we were going because looking straight out ahead was just a gray, a gray cloud of snow going past. Uh, but once we got to the 14th Street Bridge, it actually cleared out a little bit. We saw the shattered ice and what appeared to be a debris field out in between the two bridges. There's people everywhere. There was traffic stopped everywhere. Amid the chaos, Don Usher and his crew rescued Bert Hamilton, whose right arm had broken during the impact. Bert jumped onto the aircraft before we were ready for him. Uh, Gene was inside trying to get set up, and while I was hovering, he actually swam out and reached up and grabbed a hold of the skid. And they started to lift up, and that was, and then I slipped, lost my grip, and fell off. They'd found a piece of rope in the back of the helicopter, and he dropped it down to me, and I grabbed it, and I started wrapping it around my neck. And he's up there screaming, turn it loose, turn it loose. And I'm screaming, no, pull, pull. And fortunately, he got it away from me, and then they were able to get a loop in it and got it up under my arm. The helicopter managed to pull Bert and four more survivors from the numbing waters. If you just go to a barbecue in the middle of the summer and they have a barrel full of ice and sodas and all that stuff and stick your arm in there, that water's probably 40 degrees, not close to freezing. Put your arm in there for 10 minutes and then let me fly over in a helicopter, drop a rope to you, and you hold on. I don't know how they did it. One woman was unable to hang on to the safety line and fell back into the water. 20 feet from shore. A courageous bystander jumped in to rescue her. Back on shore, Bert's body temperature had dropped to 82 degrees. A few more minutes in the icy Potomac would have likely sent him into cardiac arrest. I didn't feel the cold or sense the cold until after I, they'd actually got me out of the water. And when they got me on the stretcher, then you start shivering. You shiver so hard. If they didn't have me strapped down, I would have come right off the stretcher. I mean, I believe very strongly God spared my life. Blizzards can be deadly for communities that are caught off guard. It happened in March 1993, when a freak superstorm blanketed one third of the country in snow. In 1993, there was a blizzard that went up the East Coast, uh, started in the Gulf of Mexico and proceeded up the East Coast, uh, dropping tremendous amount of snow, resulting in hundreds of deaths in the United States and more than $6 billion in damages. The main criteria for the superstorm was that Rarely had any other storm ever produced that much snow over as wide an area. 18 inches of snow fell in New York City, while Boston was quickly buried under a foot. But one of the most unprepared areas was Western North Carolina. Some parts received up to five feet of snow in just 48 hours. News 13 Special Weather Bulletin. This will be one to remember and probably go down in the record books. Let me inform you on the watches, warnings, and advisories. Right now, a blizzard warning is in effect for the mountains of western North Carolina. This area had not seen anything like that for 50 years. Uh, people were not expecting 50, 60 mile per hour winds. They weren't expecting wind chill values at or below zero. They weren't expecting two, three, four feet of snow. They weren't expecting snow drifts, four, five, six feet. 
The snow started falling on a Friday evening and continued strong through the next morning. We have an unofficial measurement here we're going to do for you right here on Charlotte Street. We're going to stick this ruler in and see what we've got. Definitely unofficial, just about 11 inches here, and it is still falling. Our weather wire was printing up hourly reports and special weather statements, and I was looking at this and seeing how the temperature was falling and how wind speeds were increasing 30, 40, 50 miles per hour, wind chill values at or below zero, heavy snow being reported, thunder snow being reported. It was just absolutely amazing to dream that a few feet away from me outside that building, uh, the worst winter storm in 50 years was wreaking havoc. On the satellite picture, you can see that big, humongous swirl in the atmosphere. That's our superstorm, my friends. None of us had ever seen a blizzard advisory. We didn't even know really what a blizzard was. It sort of just seemed descriptive as opposed to an actual scientific event. There was someone in a minivan joyriding. So I swerved to miss them and bury my vehicle in a five-foot snowdrift. Well, luckily, I was only a quarter mile away from the house. So I, I walked to the house, get the shovel. My wife's looking at me. I'm standing up to my waist in snow. She says, how are you going to get in the front door? Many people were stuck in their homes without power. Their only connection to the outside world was through the radio. We figured by that first Saturday, we had about half of our 51,000 customers out. We worked all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and Monday afternoon, we figured we still had about half of our customers out. It was nothing we'd ever seen before without precedent. We've got the snow on the roads, we've got the power lines on the roads, and we've got the trees on the roads. Transportation is basically becoming impossible. As we made our way up Interstate 26, we found truck after truck jackknifed and stranded. Many people had just given up altogether and abandoned their cars in search of shelter. Cars were everywhere. Nobody was in them, but it looked like those paintings that you see of fundamentalist Christian belief that there will be a rapture one day and that it will come unexpectedly and people will be vacated from wherever they are. That's what it looked like. At least three people died in Western North Carolina during this superstorm, but the blizzard also created new bonds between neighbors. One of the greatest things that ever came out of it was how the people in the communities and the neighborhoods actually pulled together. I spoke with my neighbors probably more in a three-day period than I had ever spoken to them in the four or five years that I had lived in the neighborhood. Coming up next on Blizzard, Storms of ice. Oh my God! It was really scary. It was almost like the end of the world. <laughs> there she goes. There she goes. There goes this one. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. The whipping sound of the power lines was the scariest thing. Oh my God. I didn't even stop to think about, I might get electrocuted when those lines went down. It just happened so fast. Nothing like that I had ever seen before. Ice storms. They sometimes create winter wonderlands, but they're one of the most insidious kinds of precipitation. An ice storm is any storm that produces rain rather than snow that freezes on contact on the ground surface because temperatures right at the surface are below freezing. As the rain freezes, it encases everything on the ground with layer upon layer of ice. The storm may only last a few hours, but by then, an entire community may be shut down. 
One of the biggest dangers is for road surfaces. You can even just have a light drizzle and it could be enough to create an instant uh, calamity. Each year, an estimated six to 7,000 people die in car crashes on slick, icy roads. Not only do you have people slipping, sliding, spinning in circles and crashing into each other, but you have infrastructure like above ground power lines just being torn apart, not to mention trees. It's one of nature's natural pruning devices, but it's pretty ugly. In January 1998, a powerful ice storm shut down major cities throughout the Northeast United States and Southeast Canada. In Plattsburgh, New York, 24 miles south of the Canadian border, meteorologist Tom Messner was covering the storm for WPTZ-TV. The sound was absolutely incredible. I mean, I've never heard anything like it. And it just didn't end. You would hear the crunching slowly, and then it would kind of increase. All our trees are gone. This is what has been happening since about 3 o'clock this morning. Down trees and power lines covered the roadways. I was driving into News Channel 5 and I came up on a car that was stopped and I couldn't really see why, so I got out of the car, that person was out too, and there was a line across the street. And it was interesting because you had to kind of decide, what am I gonna do? Do you drive over it? Is it live? You know, so it was a little disconcerting, but we ended up driving over it, obviously everything was fine. And that's the kind of thing that people were dealing with day in and day out. About a half hour north of Plattsburgh, Dairy farmer Marlene Ashline was with her husband and two children when they were nearly trapped by frozen power lines. The power line started to sway, and we looked up, and probably within a few seconds, all the power lines were coming down in front of us. There she goes. There goes this one. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Everything was encased with ice. It was really scary. It was almost like another world. You know, it was almost like the end of the world. Yeah, that's a good one. In four days, the storm coated the Lake Champlain Valley with up to five inches of ice. The landscape was transformed. I can remember looking and seeing the beauty of the ice and then knowing I would need to draw on that over the next few weeks because it was not going to be all beautiful. Power outages were widespread, but crews couldn't get through on the blocked roads to make repairs. Many homes had no heat. My home was down to 34 degrees, and they were forecasting below zero weather in a few days. We had at least five layers of clothing on, earmuffs, long johns, four or five pairs of socks, boots. I had no power to do any cooking, so I had my barbecue grill outside. Only half of the food got cooked because the fuel ran out. So I had half-cooked food, and we ended up eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. For almost two weeks, the Ash Lines used a generator to milk, feed, and clean their 160 cows. No power, you can't milk your cows. We had to take care of them first and forget about ourselves. To make matters worse, the icy roads were preventing dairy trucks from making their daily pickups. And that's our money right there. And if the milk truck doesn't come and pick up the milk, you don't get a paycheck. It was three days before a dairy truck made it to Marlene's farm. By then, the ash lines had already dumped seven and a half tons of milk unable to keep it from spoiling. The ice storm caused over $4 billion worth of damage in the U.S. and Canada. We had been very lucky until then. We'd had floods, we'd had snowstorms, we'd had blizzards. This was 
a disaster that went in everybody's yard, and we all had to deal with it. When we return, walking on thin ice. We heard people yelling, ice is breaking, ice is breaking. the allure of a frozen lake or river. For some, it's an icy playground, but it can also be a trap. A lot of times the ice can be pretty thin. So unless you're in a location where they've had persistent freezes, it's constantly below freezing and a solid layer of ice develops that can really withstand a lot of weight on top. Take great caution when ever trying to walk across ice on a lake it could be thinner than you think. In February 1995, an ice skater fell through the frozen surface of Lake St. Clair, just outside of Detroit, Michigan. What do you need? They can't get them out. Yeah, they got them. They got them. We know when we go out to rescue somebody, we are bound to fall through also. We wear dry suits when we go out. We are protected. We continuously train, and we are ready for this job, no matter what the circumstances are. Dry suits did protect these Coast Guardsmen when they also fell through the ice during the rescue. Without insulated clothing, victims can only survive in icy water for up to 30 minutes. Hurry up, get the light! Hey, Toledo! Hey, hands are coming for the... Here! Go on to him! You got it! Here! Hypothermia sets in when body temperatures fall below 96 degrees. If this core temperature falls below 82 degrees, the heart and lungs stop working. Go! 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 This ice skater had no pulse. He had to be taken to the hospital, where he was revived. If you fall through the ice, it takes your breath away. And the best way to explain this is to take your hand and just put your hand into ice cold water and see how long you can keep it there. You will start realizing the pain associated with that. Now just imagine your entire body in the lake, that cold water, losing your dexterity. What happens is, is the blood tends to move away from your outer extremities, your legs, your hands, and it's kind of a protectionary response. All the blood pools to the center of your body to protect and give that nourishment to your most vital organs, your heart, your lungs. And fortunately, members lose their dexterity, their ability to move their fingers, their arms, or to even help themselves. Recreational ice fishermen don't seem to mind braving the elements to catch their prey. We're in a shanty with a heater. It's like having like a little resort on the water. There's a nice crappie. Then if you look in the hole, you can see all the way to the bottom, see the fish swimming around and everything. And it's, I just think it's like the, one of the coolest things in the world. There are safe ways to ice fish. Winds should be blowing towards the shore, and temperatures should remain below freezing. The ice itself should be as thick as possible. Clear ice is the strongest and safest kind. This ice here is about two inches in thickness. This is clear ice, which is ice that forms during a really hard freeze. It's very see-through, and this right here has a, a higher load-bearing capacity than the snow ice or a layered ice. It's also safer for fishermen to wear survival suits. These anglers were only wearing coats when the ice beneath them cracked. Rescuers had to dress them in life suits before pulling them ashore through the frozen waters. Ice fishermen are also in constant danger of separating from the larger body of ice and becoming stranded on a float. In 1998, James Culpa and 17 others were fishing on Lake St. Clair when they suddenly began drifting. We heard people yelling, ice is breaking, ice is breaking. So then 
me and my friend jump out of the shanty, look over, see a big canal of water, like, all the way to the shore, all the way past, out into the lake. Like, you know, this, this is just not good. And then it's, like, already too far to even try jumping over, and then constantly the gap just kept on getting bigger. The group had settled on the edge of the ice attached to shore, which was too close to the open water. Winds began to blow. The ice they were on sheared off along a wet crack. We were on our own little island. We just kept on sinking underwater. We had to keep on backing up, getting on drier ice. We were walking through like knee deep of water. By the time we got on scene, there was already a separation of a quarter of a mile because the winds were blowing about 40 knots. After a period of two hours, while these rescues were being conducted, that ice flow with those 18 people had proceeded over two miles out into the lake. When we got on the ice flow, they were all panicking, but they were, they were at least calm enough to know which people need to get off first. The call came in at 5 p.m., and then the rescue really wasn't over until around 10 p.m. The weather had changed so much after the initial call because we started getting 40 knot winds, blizzard snow conditions, and all the winds were coming from the west. In spite of the weather, no one was seriously injured. Some of the folks they were very educated fishermen. Unfortunately, they didn't heed their own knowledge. They, they basically put their own personal life in jeopardy. It may take a couple months, but then they forget about it, and then they do venture back out on the ice again. Coming up next, winter on the raging water. The sea's got no conscience. It, it doesn't have any pity. When the gamblers sank, we weren't far from shore. Just a bad day. While winter can be fierce on land, it's even more unforgiving on the open seas. A storm over water, you don't see the snow because it doesn't accumulate. It just melts in contact with the water, so it has a different appearance, but you still have the raging winds. In fact, winds are usually stronger over water because there's nothing to slow it down. During wintertime, you'll also get much stronger storm systems, which lead to greater waves, much more dangerous conditions. As temperatures drop, winter waves feel like they gain even greater power. The water is colder, and the sea hits your boat a lot harder than it does in the summer with the warmer salt water. 37-year-old Sam Baird of Wellfleet, Massachusetts, has worked on fishing vessels since the age of seven. He's often gone to sea in the dead of winter, searching for sea clams and scallops. It's a brutal season to be on the Atlantic Ocean. I like being at sea. I like fishing. The money's good. You deal with getting cold and being miserable and everything else. Some people are good at knowing when storms are coming, and some people get caught in storms. It's, it's definitely a gamble. It, it's uh, one of the most dangerous jobs in the country. Storms aren't the only danger. The combination of cold water and frigid winds can sink a vessel. You got steel rigging, you got steel gear, you got water coming over, and it's freezing on the boat. It could definitely be a problem. If unexpected problems arise, the winter sea can be particularly cruel. On April 3rd, 1994, Sam was the captain of a fishing boat named the Gambler. It was late afternoon, and the winds were blowing around 35 to 40 knots. For an unknown reason, the vessel began taking on water. I was napping. I had a deckhand at the wheel. I believe it was probably a 12 to 15 foot sea. By the time I woke up and realized there was a problem, the engine room was halfway full of water. The gambler, with its crew of four, was sinking. Sam radioed the Coast Guard, who made it to the ship within an hour. 
by then, the winds were dying down, but there was no time to pump the engine rooms. Sam had to do what every captain dreads, abandon ship. Obviously, I had no choice. I didn't want to go down with the boat. When I stepped off, there was nothing else I could do. The Atlantic Ocean swallowed up the gambler, but spared Sam and his crew. She's got no conscience. It doesn't have any pity. And it's taken a lot of boats and a lot of people. You got to play the weather, you got to run from the weather, and you got to hide from the weather. It's hard for a boat to hide when it's hemmed in by miles of immobilizing ice. And in the winter, large bodies of water, such as the upper Great Lakes, freeze regularly, making travel nearly impossible. The equivalent would be like sailing through a, a frozen drink, a Slurpee or a margarita, what have you, and it becomes sticky and actually wants to adhere to the side of the ship. Carl Hardesty has been piloting ships on the Great Lakes for seven years. Every winter, his shipping routes are transformed into endless fields of ice. If you can keep the ship moving, you really don't have a problem. If you do start to slow down, the ice becomes heavier. It's just like hitting a brick wall. In the winter of 1998, Carl had to push through some of the toughest ice he had ever encountered. The ice was so bad in the western basin of Lake Erie that we were moving ahead one to 200 feet at a time. We'd shove both engines full ahead, we'd ram into the ice, then we'd back both engines full, push them full ahead again. We spent the better part of, I think, two days doing that. Even the most powerful vessels can get trapped in frozen waters. The Coast Guard has special cutters that can churn through several feet of ice, creating a path or track. This ship, the Cutter Mobile Bay, is one of nine Coast Guard 140-foot ice-breaking tugs that are specifically designed to break ice by riding up on the ice and the weight of the ship crushes the ice and then the milling propeller mills the ice as we go through. For ships that can reach lengths over a thousand feet, narrow waterways pose one of the biggest problems. The smaller, more mobile cutters are often a saving grace. Merchant seamen always have a lot of jokes about the Coast Guard, but uh, when you get stuck, it's always nice to see those racing stripes coming towards you, get you on your way again. Next on Blizzard, when the snow melts, the floods begin. The water just, like a big blender, just took everything and spun it around and spewed it everywhere. It's pretty bizarre when you live in North Dakota in the middle of the country and you look around and you see the Coast Guard. <laughs> you know you're in trouble then. Devastating floods aren't always associated with harsh winters, yet sometimes they go hand in hand with blizzards and ice storms. After a storm, as temperatures rise, all that snow and ice must eventually melt and drain away. If the snow melts near a river or valley, like the Red River Valley in eastern North Dakota and northwest Minnesota, there is potential for disaster. That's one of the few major rivers that flows from south to north. What that means, snow usually melts from south to north. The surge of snow melt follows the melt down the river so that it keeps adding up, adding up, adding up. Things did add up along the banks of the Red River in Grand Forks, North Dakota, beginning in November 1996. Within six months, eight major blizzards slammed the area. Our typical winters here are about 42 inches of snow. That particular year, 96, 97 winter, we had a little over 90 inches of snow. Roads were shut down. Homes and businesses lost power. A stranded motorist froze to death when wind chills dropped to 80 below zero. The National Guard was called in to remove the snow, but it continued to pile up. So it seemed like whenever we did get something open and it was accessible, then a few nights later, it would blow either shut again or we'd get some more snowfalls. 
It was hard on the equipment and tough on the people to put up with those types of wind chills. Officials knew that when temperatures finally warmed up, flooding was almost certain. Volunteers helped National Guardsmen build dikes. But in April, the valley was hit with both an ice storm and its eighth blizzard. When the ice storm hit, it basically froze everything. So all that preparation, the hundreds of thousands of sandbags became bricks. Then temperatures rose quickly to the mid 40s and the feared thaw began. The townspeople worked around the clock to hold off the surging waters. I looked up, there's presidents of a bank here, there's students. I mean, it wasn't who you were, it was you were a citizen of this town, you're part of this community. We all pitched in and helped each other. Their best efforts were still not enough. The sandbags and clay dikes were constructed to hold back 53 feet of water. The flood crested at 54 feet. Most of Grand Forks, 50,000 residents were evacuated. The flood engulfed 95% of the town. The water just, like a big blender, just took everything and spun it around and spewed it everywhere. I saw our restaurant in shambles and I just started crying. I've been working crisis work most of my career. This was one of the first times that I, in fact, was a victim of the very crisis I was responding to. It was a very hard decision for me to not only look at my house, but look at all my neighbors and say, we have to leave. It was the first time I saw the house, I couldn't believe it. The house is, is underneath water. It was this incredible scene, furniture floating around the living room, and the smell was incredible. It was just as a ghastly sewer smell through the whole house. In downtown Grand Forks, the floodwaters created yet another crisis that took rescue crews by surprise. All of a sudden, when they said, we got a fire, they jumped from rooftop to rooftop. Major fire jumped about a block and a half, two blocks, were start the second fire. The National Guard used fire trucks on flatbed barges to put out the flames. It would take over two weeks for the floodwaters to recede and for the residents of Grand Forks to begin sorting through the aftermath. We were extremely lucky. Nobody did lose their life. That was one of the things that is remarkable about the whole situation. When you look at the extent of the flooding and how fast the flood actually occurred once it did breach. Coming up, extreme cold, the danger. My body temperature was in the 80s. And the delight. Freezing cold temperatures. It's the most obvious attribute of winter weather, yet it can be one of the stealthiest. Within just a few hours, the thermometer can plummet, punishing the unprepared. I don't know that weather should be feared, but I think you should be prepared for extremes of weather. We live in Southern California, and you think of lovely, sunny, um, mild temperatures, and yet right in our backyard is a mountain range where people have died. Cindy Moyner England almost became one of those people during a day trip on November 30th, 1991. She and her boyfriend's 11-year-old nephew, Ryan McIntosh, were hiking to the summit of Mount Baldy, 44 miles northeast of Los Angeles. The temperature that day when we started out was probably, I'd say, in the 50s. If you kept moving, you were fine, though. But the temperatures changed drastically. A storm moved in, dropping eight inches of snow and reducing visibility. Cindy and Ryan could not see a clear path to hike back down the mountain. They were trapped overnight. So I kept eating snow, trying to hydrate myself. We were both shivering uncontrollably. I remember telling him, I think I'm going to fracture my teeth because I was just chattering so, you know, vigorously. We spent a lot of time just praying we'd get through it. We were told that with the wind chill, the temperature got to minus 40 degrees. After two miserable days, 
the hikers were rescued. My body temperature was in the 80s. We were both diagnosed with frostbite and exhaustion. Frostbite is actually the condition where your tissues are literally damaged by the effects of cold. It's vital tissue that's freezing, dying, and it's obviously a very dangerous condition. While most people try to avoid extreme winter weather, there are those who embrace it. The current water temperature is 32 degrees. The current air temperature is 26 degrees. So it's going to be warmer in the water than it is going to be out here. Polar Bear Club members around the world celebrate New Year's with an unusual ritual by diving into numbing waters. It's probably one of the more sane ways to ring in the New Year compared to the way some people do it. It's safe. There's no better way to start out the year than at zero degrees. Celsius because there's no place to go but up. It's intense, yeah. It feels like you jump into burning water. Just burning. It, it, it wakes you up in the morning. And you can't breathe. What else? You think you're gonna die. It was supposed to be a healthful benefit to temperature cycle. Go in cold water, go in hot water. It promotes circulation. Some of these human polar bears are able to withstand the freezing water longer than others. Most take a quick dip before heading to the hot tub. It's a bitey feeling all over. It doesn't last too long. One does have a desire to, to leave rather quickly, but you can fight that. Diving into the cold is not everyone's idea of fun, but it is a way to make the most out of extreme winter conditions. After all, whether it's snowing, blowing, or just plain freezing. Old Man Winter always has a few tricks up his sleeve. It's great that people figure out ways to celebrate extreme weather because we're gonna deal with it one way or the other, so might as well have fun when we can. <laughs>